Greetings book lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks. And today I am so happy to be joined by the middle grade author of many amazing Jewish themed novels, not to mention one of my favorite storytellers. Who am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the wonderful Sydney Taylor Notable award-winning and PJ Arway Canadian author, Joanne Levy. Having Joanne on my podcast is such a special treat because even before I started the E-Train Talks podcast, Joanne was a huge supporter of my reading journey. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Joanne, she has such a gift for stories. Her compelling books are filled with such meaningful themes like friendship, grief, acceptance, and tolerance. I'm such a fan of Joanne's novels and I love just everything, all the aspects of her books. And here I have four, well, three and a cover of all of her books that I've loved and read. We have Sorry for Your Loss, which is a Sydney Taylor Notable Award winner, Fish Out of Water, which was the first book that I ever read by Joanne Levy, and the first book that my whole family read together. We have Yael and the Party of the Year by Tamsin Lane. That's Joanne Levy's pseudonym. And we have the Book of Elsie, which is coming out in August, on August 16th. And I so glad that I had the opportunity to read an electronic advanced readers copy and you're going to love it everybody and if you haven't read any of Joanne Levy's books you need to get your hands on some copies now Joanne Levy's books she fills them with cheer but also important messages like combating anti-semitism and just kind of being yourself and you don't doesn't matter what other people say about you you need to be true to yourself and just themes like that. And if you're not already interested, well, we have a whole interview to look forward to. Thank you so much for joining me on E-Train Talks today, Joanne. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And, and I'm not sure I can live up to such an amazing intro. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, thank you. You're a huge inspiration for me and so many other authors and kids out there who really love your stories. And I know that so many children, middle graders, we can all really relate to your novels. And we're grateful that you write so many middle grade books and you have so many more in the works, which is super exciting. And now on to my first question. So my first four questions are gonna be about four of Joanne Levy's books. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is the first one that I ever read by Joanne Levy, Fish Out of Water. So Fish Out of Water is about a boy preparing for his bar mitzvah. And this storyline is something that I really relate to and so many other Jewish kids do as well, because a lot of us are going to be going through our bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs and b'nai mitzvahs soon. And in Fish Out of Water, the protagonist Fischl, also known as Fish, is criticized by his peers and even his own bubby, grandmother in Yiddish, for wanting to learn how to knit because he's told knitting is for girls. Firstly, why did you choose knitting as Fischl's interest and eventually hobby? And were there any times in your life when you wanted to break the mold and participate in activities that are considered only for boys? Or do you know people who felt the same way as Fischl? So those are great questions. Thank you for those. Um, to answer your first one first about knitting, um, I actually can't remember exactly why I chose knitting. I was a crafty kid. So I did a lot of crafts and, and knitting was one of them. And I think I was actually sitting around talking to my husband about what kind of activities might be considered um, girly, I'm doing air quotes, um, that a boy might be discouraged from doing for, for no good reason. So I expect that knitting just came up because it's popular these days and it, it's typically something that more women do. Um, and as far as if I was discouraged from doing anything um, that was too boyish or too masculine, I don't recall that I was. Um, I grew up with three older brothers. So my parents were extremely supportive of me. And they always said, you know what, Joanne, you can do whatever you want. You can be a doctor, you can be uh, an astronaut, whatever you put your heart to, you can do. So they were always supportive that way. Um, but at the same time, we had sort of gender-related jobs in the house. 
And I remember thinking that that seemed a little unfair, that I was expected to help in the kitchen and the boys, my brothers did um, snow shoveling and outdoor work and things like that. So, and it was, it was based only on me being a girl and them being boys. And so it was kind of a subtle sexism and gender stereotypes. And that sort of grew into where I wanted to go with Fish Out of Water. It, it was sort of the well-meaning people that in the big picture were always supportive, but it was those little things that we may not notice. And in writing the book, it, it forced me to sort of look at how I think of gender roles and stereotypes and if they actually do make sense. So that's behind a lot of um, what went into the book, more of that casual stuff that people don't necessarily notice. That's really interesting. And I find it really intriguing and also just kind of sad, like just such subtle like there are subtle differences in the just maybe the chores that you did and people don't really notice they just kind of think it's how things are supposed to go um and I also think that having I it's also so great that you had supportive parents who supported your dreams because a lot of people don't really have don't really have that and I'm so glad that you had someone to support you. I also have my parents. They're incredible. And sorry for your loss, Evie's father owns a mortuary and is a funeral director. And because of this, Evie witnesses heartbreak and grief among family and friends that attend the funerals of their loved ones. I also read that your father owned a mortuary. And did you experience anything similar to what Evie went through because of your dad's work? And have these experiences influenced your writing at all? That's a great question. Um, so the weird thing about my my dad manages a funeral home. Um, he doesn't own it, but he does manage it. Um, but he came to it actually quite later in life. It was sort of his second, third, maybe fourth career. So he was well into his 60s when he took over as the manager of the funeral home. So I was out of the house. And so oh. I, I didn't actually grow up there the way that Evie does in the book. So it was interesting for me to try and put my brain into what a kid growing up in that atmosphere would think about and do. And I really wanted to sort of normalize that it's just the family business. I mean, there's a lot of heartbreak and grief that goes around it. But for Evie, because she grows up there and she works part time, it's, it's a window into what is potentially a scary setting but giving it sort of a mundane, everyday feel about it. So kids and adults who read the book can, can sort of see it in a different light than what we would normally see. Um, but I will say that a lot of the book, um, the book wouldn't exist if I hadn't lost my mom. So my mom died in 2013, and it was a pretty terrible experience. Um, but my dad, being the, the funeral director, um, we got behind the scenes access after she died and she came home from the hospital. And I hope I'm not scaring any of your listeners, but knowing what goes on there is was actually really comforting for me. So it was sort of a light bulb moment when I realized that through that access of knowing how she would be cared for and what would what would happen and and just the respect that she would be treated with it made it a little bit easier for me. So that informed a lot of the book and made me really want to put that into the pages so people could see that although death is awful and grief is awful, there are some ways you can be comforted. And, and knowing some of the rituals um, surrounding death and grief and funerals um, can be quite comforting. Yeah, I can really understand that and kind of knowing what goes on, it definitely can be comforting. And while I haven't experienced that firsthand, I know from reading Sorry for Your Loss that really normalizing the situation and knowing what happens, it can really make a difference. Like if you don't go behind the scenes, you, you might think that it's just filled with grief, sadness, and all the horrible feelings. But when you really know what's going on, it can really change your perspective. And so I think that your answer is really interesting. And I also had no idea that 
your father actually got into the manager of the funeral home job in his 60s and you were out of the house. So it must, that just adds more awe in my opinion, because you weren't even a kid. You had to get into the head of a kid whose father owned a funeral, oh, managed a funeral home. And so that must have been a little bit tough, but you also kind of knew what was going on. You'd seen some of the things that happened. So now I'm going to talk about The Sun Will Come Out, which unfortunately I don't have on hand, but I just loved it equally as much as I love Sorry for Your Loss and Fish Out of Water. So in The Sun Will Come Out, the main character, B, has to face the trials and tribulations of friendship while attending Jewish summer camp, Camp Shalom. At first, it's a real struggle for B to fit in without her best friend, and it was just kind of a really new experience. But soon, she finds a boy named Harry. Harry is a unique, funny, and compassionate person, and soon he and B become great friends. But little does she know that Harry is hiding a huge secret, a secret that will change everything. And I absolutely adore the storyline behind The Sun Will Come Out. So what was the inspiration behind B's story? That's a great question. Um, I actually went to Sleepaway Summer Camp for three summers. And my first two summers were great. And my third summer, I actually went to a different camp where I didn't know anybody. And it was terrible. It was, I had the worst time. And I sent my parents tons of letters about how unhappy I was and how I wanted to come home. And I actually spent a good chunk of time in the infirmary. And I can't remember, I know I wouldn't have gone there um, under false pretenses. I'm sure I had an, a legitimate illness or injury to get me there, but I think I probably stayed longer than I needed to, to get better, just because I was having such a terrible time in my cabin. So it was, the book is partially inspired by true events. Um, I never met a kid named Harry. He's totally fabricated, although he does have real um, things going on in his life that I'm not going to spoil for your listeners. Um, but yeah, it was inspired by my one terrible year um, at summer camp, which just goes to show that sometimes terrible stuff can turn into great things later in life because you can mine them for your writing. So <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's what it was inspired by. Some of the things really happened, but most of them were made up. Um, but it was just the feelings of feeling alone and not having any friends and trying to look for silver linings in terrible situations and being kind of shy. Um, he's definitely very shy. And, and I was shy back then, too. So, yeah, loosely based on real events. So that's a really interesting answer. And B talks a lot, B's dad talks a lot about finding the silver lining. And I think that's a really interesting and meaningful theme that I haven't really, I've noticed it a lot in many novels, but I feel like B's story, it's finding the silver lining in a different way. Like sometimes you find it, like you have a power inside of you, but B really has to find the silver lining through someone else and like there are books like the spinner of dreams by chris ray so chris reynolds she her main character had to find the power inside of her and that's what a lot of books are like finding this that silver lining inside of you but b has to find that elsewhere and it really made for an entertaining story and i'm excited to talk a bit about your latest middle grade novel whoop, the book of elsie i don't have a physical copy not yet so I had to make do with this. So it's coming out on August 16th, and I'm so glad I was able to read an advanced reader's copy of your new book. And I found it to be such an entertaining and important middle grade read. Without giving away any spoilers, because it's not out yet, and we don't want to give away too much, everybody. You need to read it along with all of Joanne Lovey's novels. So can you share a bit about the book of Elsie? Because there isn't much information surrounding it as it's not out yet. And what's a lesson that you hope readers will take away from Elsie's tale? Sure, sure. So I wanted to write a book that sort of parallels the Purim story. So for any of your listeners who aren't familiar with the Purim story, it's sort of the age old um, anti-Semitism. People hate Jewish people, try to kill us, we prevail. Um, and at the center of the story is um, Esther, 
who I'm not going to you know, tell you the whole Purim story here, but she's super fierce and strong and, and risks her life. And, and she is just like a superhero of her time. So I wanted to write a book that sort of parallels that. And that's why it's called the book of Elsie um, to parallel the book of Esther. Um, so Elsie is um, a girl who is super looking forward to her Purim party. And Purim is um, I guess it, it would be considered the most fun Jewish holiday where people dress up and, and you eat lots and, you know, adults drink lots and it's, it's supposed to be just a really fun time. So she's looking forward to the dress up party, um, but she finds out that the party is going to be canceled um, because the synagogue has fallen on rough times. Um, so she decides she's going to save her Purim party and her synagogue. And um, she runs into some obstacles uh, where anti-Semitism comes in and her best friend, Grace, who is black, um, also runs into discrimination as well. So it's a book about um, standing up and being fierce in the face of adversity and, and not backing down to hate. Um, and I really wanted to have a book where it's sort of in your face, the things that many people face as far as discrimination and prejudice. Um, it's not just anti-Semitism, it's, it's hate all over and it's on the rise. And, um, you know, I just want to show kids, um, you know, maybe how to combat that, that and not get sucked into it and not hate back because that doesn't solve anything. Yeah. So that's my very long-winded answer to your good question. <laughs> uh, well, that definitely sounds... I mean, I read it and just hearing that description makes me want to read it again. And there are a lot of parallels between the Book of Elsie and the Book of Esther, which I certainly noticed. And if you're not familiar with the Book of Esther, well, that's also something that you can look into because it really is a fun, but also really important just story to really to read and it shows that there was anti-Semitism thousands of years ago, and you would have thought that, like, hate, that sort of hate would have been discontinued over the years. Someone would have put a stop to it, but there's still hate going on in the world, and the Book of Elsie is really built to combat the anti-Semitism and show how you can really make a difference in your community like Elsie and like Grace. And there are also some twists and turns along the way in the Book of Elsie. It's not all, oh, we're going to stop this and everything's going to be okay. Because there are definitely some bumps, some twists, some roadblocks. And you'll just have to read the Book of Elsie to find out what those are and how Elsie and Grace get over the hump. What would you say fuels your passion for everything literacy? I grew up loving books. Um, and... I think that um, the best way to build empathy in people and fight hate is to make books and share books that, that people can read and learn about people not like themselves. So there's, there's this um, saying, it's, it's used in education about window, window and mirror books. And window books are to see people not like you and look through a window at somebody else. And mirror books are books that you see yourself in the book. So it's, it's sort of a representation thing. Um, so I write my books um, to be both. And, and I think that literacy is so important because it, it teaches kids about the world around them. And I think that hate grows where books aren't and where people aren't able to see beyond their immediate world. Um, and I think anti-Semitism um, and racism, prejudice, all, all that terrible stuff builds out of fear of the unknown. Um, and I know there's people out there who have never met a Jewish person and they may be vulnerable to the old stereotypes, the terrible stereotypes. And similarly with, with BIPOC people, um, you know, if, if you don't know any, you can be vulnerable to assume the worst things that you may hear. Um, so I think that, that books are a way, a gateway into learning about 
the world at large and finding out that um, other people are just like you. Um, we may pray in a different place. We may eat different foods. We may wear different clothes. But in the, inside, we're all the same. And we all want the same things. We want to belong. We want to be respected. And we want to live our lives. Um, and many times graciously and with love. So um, literacy, I think, is the key to that. And, and distributing books and making books that, that show the world around us. So I've watched some of your webinars and read your books aimed at combating anti-Semitism. So would you share ways everyone listening or watching can take action to combat anti-Semitism? And also, I've heard that a lot of people consider um, Jewish books to not be diverse. And people say that some manuscripts are too Jewish. So have you ever experienced this on your writing journey or just really any forms, uh, like how can we combat anti-Semitism? And what are some forms that you've heard? Okay, so those are three big questions. So I'm going to start from the beginning. So um, the first one was how to combat anti-Semitism. So just going back to, to, I think the first thing we can do is read more books about people that aren't like us. Um, and I think that that includes Jewish people reading books about um, people living a Black experience or a Christian experience and people that only know about um, their own family being Christian and celebrating Christmas, reading about people who don't. Um, I think read widely and learn about other cultures and, and learn, come to understand that, like I said before, we're all the same inside. We all want the same things. We all wanna belong and be respected and live our lives. Um, so I think that is, is the key to the very, very, very beginning of uh, creating a world without hate. Um, and that's my contribution is writing books um, that I think once they get into kids' hands, they can sort of see a, a diverse world that isn't um, very Christian centric, which, you know, my country and yours tend to be in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so segueing into Jewish books being diverse books, um, I absolutely think that Jewish books and books about Jewish characters, not even just Jewish books, um, but books about characters that just happen to be Jewish, um, some people call that casual Judaism, um, is more representative of the world around us. And yes, they are diverse because in our society, um, Christian is the default. So people assume that you celebrate Christmas and people assume that, you know, you go to church on Sunday. That's where you pray if, if you do worship. Um, so I think that a minority religion is diverse. And, and I think the assumption is that Jews are white. And that's just not the case in 100% of the time. Um, many Jews are not white. Many Jews are uh, biracial or, or just not considered white. Um, and also it, it comes back to, you know, the, the people that dislike Jews call Jews a race. So <laughs> it gets complicated there. You know, if, if the people that are trying to um, eradicate us from the planet consider us a race, then maybe we should look at that and consider that they see us as a part so we are diverse. This is a question that I like to ask authors because... I love so many books by authors and I always want to know what's next. So do you have any other projects besides the book of Elsie in the works? I do. And thank you for asking. Um, so my next book after the book of Elsie is actually Fish Out of Water is coming out in French. Oh, um, yeah. So that's exciting. That comes out in 2023. But then I don't have another new book until I think 2024, but it's called Bird Brain. Um, and it's about a girl who really wants a pet, a, a puppy or a kitten, and she ends up with her uncle's bird. So that's called Bird Brain, and that'll be, well, a long time from now, but that's what's next. Yeah. Well, I'm very excited for what's next, and if anybody in France is watching, <laughs> stay tuned for Fish Out of Water in French, because you're going to love the story as much as I did as an English speaker um, and reader. So now time for the final question. The question I ask every one of my guests, 
And each answer is profound in its own way. And I'm excited to see what you have to offer, what your answer is. So if you could be or meet any literary character, fictional or real, from any time period, just anybody who's related to books, who would it be and why? Hmm. You know, I didn't prepare for this question and now I feel like I'm on the spot and I should have prepared a little better. Um, hmm. I don't know. Maybe one of my favorite books as a kid was Anne of Green Gables. And maybe it was just a simpler time. A lot of times I wish we didn't have technology and we would just focus more on relationships and the world around us and, and just a simple life that has great meaning in relationships. So maybe I would like to be Anne of Green Gables and I have the red hair and I'm adopted and I'm Canadian. So I think I would fit pretty well into that role. So let's say Anne of Green Gables. Have you read Anne of Green Gables? I haven't, but I know that so many people who've been on my podcast mm -hmm. have recommended it and my, my aunt really loved it. So it still holds up. It's over a hundred years old, but it wow. still holds up. So I recommend, and I want to hear what you think when you read it. <laughs> I'll definitely share what I think of it. And thank you so much for joining me today, Joanne. So everybody, that's my talk with the award-winning author and one of my absolute favorite storytellers, Joanne Lovey. It's amazing when you find a book that you love, but when you find five, no, six books that you love by the same author, it's magic. Whoa, it's magic. I love that you write coming-of-age middle-grade books with likable and relatable characters and that you include Jewish components to your stories. It just makes it so incredible for Jewish kids and also non-Jewish kids to really kind of either learn more about your own religion or really kind of come to understand others. And because sometimes we, we kind of feel a little lost, like just misunderstood because not many people understand what we're going through. So having books like Joanne Lovey's novels, it can be really it can really change your perspective about a lot of ideas <laughs> well that's all for today everyone thank you so much for sharing your writing journey with us joanne we all are so grateful that you took the time to join us today on e-train talks and we're excited for what's next everybody in france keep a look out and pre-order your copy of fish out of water and in 2024 i cannot wait to read bird brain i'm sure it's going to be an outstanding novel and just go to your local bookstore, go wherever you get your books, and find a copy of any of Joanne Lovey's novels. You will not regret it. And stay safe. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.